Hi everyone, welcome to Miss Adams Teaches Poetry. In this video, we're gonna be taking a look at William Blake's very famous poem, The Tiger, famous for good reason, because it's cracking. Uh, this poem comes from his um, collection, Songs of Experience, which is in contrast to Songs of Innocence, which is quite useful for your uh, context, because the Songs of Experience are all about the kind of darkness of the world and darkness of mankind. And The Tiger fits into that really well, because he poses a number of questions about how a god or a deity could create something as powerful and dangerous as a tiger, whilst also, you know, creating ideas and images of innocence. So really, it's a poem that questions how danger or darkness or evil can be present in a world that is created by a benevolent god. So it's really ahead of its time. Um, William Blake was a romantic uh, poet. He also was a nonconformist, so he had no issue with challenging the status quo, as you will see in these poems. I won't go into too much detail about context. I will do a William Blake context video at another, uh, another time, so uh, do keep a little eye out for that one. Without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so let's start with the title of the poem. So this poem is called The Tiger. Now, the first thing that you're going to notice is that the spelling is different to how we would normally spell tiger. It's an archaic spelling, archaic meaning from the past, a word that's fallen out of usage. Um, but it was actually quite archaic when William Blake chose to use it. So William Blake deliberately chose to use this spelling as opposed to tiger spelt T I. T-I-G-E-R, which perhaps tells us that this, in Blake's mind, is this, uh, the tiger is a concept that surpasses his time, you know, that it's from the past, which fits in with the idea of the kind of symbolic notion of tiger being mankind. So it's a sort of from the past all the way through. The other thing just to be aware of is that the, the tiger was written um, in his collection of poems, Songs of Experience, and it has a counter called the lamb. Um, so the titles contrast each other because the lamb is, of course, a symbol of innocence in mankind, whereas tiger is quite the opposite. So that's just worth knowing contextually. Right, let's have a little look at the um, poem itself. We're going to look at the first two stanzas to start us off. So tiger, tiger, burning bright. So immediately we've got this repetition of tiger and the narrator of the poem, Blake, um, is seems to be actually addressing the tiger directly, so immediately elevating its status. We've got this plosive alliteration here uh, with burning bright, which is very, very powerful. So very much mimetic of what he's saying of the tiger itself. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? So. It's quite interesting here because what we have is we've got this rhetorical question that is the last two um, lines of the stanza. And that rhetorical question, con considering what immortal hand or eye could do it, could create the fearful symmetry of the tiger's face, is calling upon the ideas of the divine. It's our first kind of reference to God having created uh, the tiger. Um, I think it's interesting that we've got this uh, juxtaposition between light and dark. So there is this kind of powerful light coming from the tiger, but it's burning. It's a fire. So it's passionate. It's powerful. Um, but the tiger is in the forests of the night. So very much a creature of the night. But at the same time, there is this idea of light in the darkness. So there's a sort of sense of hope there. But you also have a sense of fear, um, this adjective, the fearful, sym um, fearful um, modifying symmetry. Now, symmetry is about the way that the tiger looks, you know, so think about the patterns on a tiger's face uh, being symmetrical. Um, <clears throat> and I think that the modal verb here is worth looking at, and we'll look at the final stanza as well in a similar light. So what immortal hand, so what deity, what godlike figure could you know, what would have the capacity, the ability to create such 
an extraordinary being, such an extraordinary beast. So there's almost a sense of wonder, um, at certainly in the power of the tiger. Now, as you probably know already, Blake was a uh, part of the Romantic movement. And when Romantic poets talked about nature, they quite often called upon the notion of the sublime, which is this incredible awe of nature, this combination of both beauty and power, beauty and danger. And the tiger really represents that. Okay, moving on to the second stanza, we have in what distant deeps or skies. So yeah, we've got some place of alliteration of the, the distant and deep again, quite a dramatic and powerful sound. But it works in particular when you think of what that deep is, distant, deep or sky. So we've got juxtaposition. So sky up here, deep down here could be is this from heaven or is this from hell? So where were you created in the distant deeps? Yeah, down in hell or up in the sky in heaven? Um, burn the fire of thine eyes. So another image of fire coming back to the burning bright. Got a lovely metaphor. Again, it's fire, it's passion, it's power, it's beauty, it's danger. On what wings did he aspire? Um, what the hand dare sees the fire. Now, this is quite interesting. We've got more repetition here. We've got repetition of what, suggesting a kind of sense of disbelief and wonder because of that interrogative pronoun. But we also have the repetition of the verb dare, suggesting that there is something to be feared in creating this. It, it, it needed bravery or perhaps audacity to be able to create such a being. Now notice here we're shifting to third person pronoun. So when he's saying on what wings dare he aspire, it's the creator of the tiger that he's talking about. We've got some interesting mythological allusion. Notice that's allusion with an A, not an I. Allusion as in you're alluding to something. You can look at this in two ways. So the reference to wings could be in relation to Daedalus, who was the father of Icarus. It's Icarus that most people know. Icarus was the one that flew too close to the sun and the sun melted his wings. Well, Daedalus was his dad and he made those wings. So there's a little sense of threat or danger. You know, is this dangerous creating such a powerful being just as it was dangerous for Icarus? And we also have Prometheus. Prometheus was the chap who stole fire from Zeus to bring it to mankind. So again, here we have what the hand dare seize the fire. So seize meaning take the fire. Um, so again, perhaps a little reference to Prometheus. Now, again, if you want to think about why danger once more, repercussions of creating or stealing something so huge and powerful, because Prometheus was punished by Zeus, bopped on a mountain top the rest of his life to have his some people say liver, some people say heart, but essentially it ripped out of his body um, every single day by a big old bird. It would regenerate every day, so it's an everlasting torture. So there's definitely the threat of danger here. We also have this metaphor being used here, and it's the first image that we're going to get in a sequence that is to do with blacksmiths, okay? Like forging work and you're going to see that in the next couple of stanzas okay let's look at the next bit so we're going to notice straight away we've got lots of repetitive forms here haven't we and what shoulder and what art so again we're using uh, that interrogative pronoun what again suggesting a sense of wonder almost disbelief um could twist the sinews of thy heart i think that verb twist is really interesting there twist the sinews it actually sounds painful it it could suggest sort of some sort of corruption that you're starting with a heart but you're twisting it again perhaps suggesting that there's a sort of darkness in the tiger notice the way that blake shifts the descriptions back and forward between tiger and god so the shoulder art god thy heart tiger and when thy heart began to beat, so creation, the tiger, what dread hand and what dread feet, back to God. Note the repetition of the adjective dread, obviously connoting 
fear here massively. Um, right, next stanza is all about um, this blacksmith imagery once more. So we've got this semantic field. We've had two semantic fields, really, because we've got semantic field of the body here. Um, and then we move into the semantic field of the blacksmith. And I think both images can be seen a little bit ironically. You know, the fact that we're using language which is associated with humans when the creator is a deity, perhaps is a little bit ironic. But what's particularly ironic here is that the image of a blacksmith, if you think about that kind of metalwork with your furnace, you're surrounded by fire. So God, associated with heaven, is being surrounded here by fire, imagery that is often associated with hell. So again, we've got this question of, is Blake um, suggesting that the kind of God that could create a tiger is a God that is dark himself? And I think the fact that we've got all of these rhetorical questions, what the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace, was thy brain, what the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp, again suggests a sense of disbelief, you know, that 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 a create like a creator could create something like this. And again, we've got that sense of fear coming in as we have repetition once more of that adjective dread, but we also have deadly terrors clasp. Um, and again, this impact of the verb dare. What creature could dare to make such a being? Again, it could be bravery. Wow, that you'd have to be brave to dare to do this. Or it could be audacity you know, how could you do this? Like, how could you be so bold as to do this? Okay, last two stanzas of the poem. Now, we've got another little bit of, um, we've got another little bit of allusion here, biblical allusion. When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears. So we've got quite a juxtaposition from the sort of darkness of the uh, blacksmith imagery. Now we've got references to heaven, stars throwing down their spears and watered heaven with their tears. This metaphor is about the notion of Lucifer, the angel originally, falling from grace and going down to hell. So Blake is reminding us of the fact that the notion of the devil, of that evil, of that darkness, came from God. Because God, of course, banished Lucifer and sent him to hell. So he's reminding us that just as God has created this tiger, God also created Lucifer, the devil. And then these rhetorical questions, did he smile his work to see? It's almost suggesting like a sense of misplaced pride. Was he proud of what he did when he created the devil? Did he who make made the lamb make thee? We've got this anaphoric structure. Did he? Did he? Anaphor is where you repeat a word at the beginning of a succession of lines. So this is quite interesting because we've got this juxtaposition uh, between the kind of notion of the tiger and the darkness of Lucifer with the symbolic image of the lamb, because a lamb is a symbol of goodness. And don't forget that lambs are normally associated with Jesus, son of God, lamb of God. OK, so he's basically saying, how is it possible that this God that created Jesus, that created innocence and goodness could have also created something so dark. And then the final stanza, tiger, tiger burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry. So note we've got a cyclical structure in this form. That first stanza from the beginning is repeated at the end. The only difference is there is a shift in this verb. So from could to dare. Now that has a lot of power because in the first stanza he's saying what would be able to do this 
And in the final stanza, he's saying um, how, not how dare, but what kind of creature would dare to do it. Again, reminding us of the sort of danger potentially and the darkness. Now, this is such a complex poem with so many different interpretations. But one of the things that I think is worth pointing out is that it poses a lot of questions and it gives no answers. So Blake is not saying this is the issue, this is the, the situation. He's posing the question, but not giving us the answer. And the fact that the poem is cyclical, so it starts where it begins, perhaps suggests that this is an ongoing debate, which funnily enough, is the case because if you think about um, people uh, who question um, ideas to do with Christianity, think about, for example, Stephen Fry, um, who questions how a god could create all of these devastating illnesses um, and awful diseases uh, that inflict children, for example. Um, another question that you might like to think about is, well, what is the tiger? Is the tiger a symbol for darkness and evil? Is the tiger a symbol of mankind? Is it the world? Is it the kind of the difficulties and the cruelties of the world? Or is it that balance between power and beauty that mankind has the capacity to be dark and to be cruel, but it, it can also be so very, very beautiful? And the other question you might like to ask yourself is, is the narrator or Blake, is, uh, is he criticising this deity for creating the tiger or is there a sense of awe you know and splendor and wonder that he finds this extraordinary and powerful again linking back to the notion of the sublime so think about those different interpretations in your response feel free to write about more than one show the examiner that you've thought of different ideas Last little bit for me is just quickly on form. This is quite a nice one to write about. There's something like, you know, you can pop this on a flashcard and whack it into your essays. So there's a real sort of sense of rigidity here. We've got six quatrains, so four line stanzas, rhyming couplets, it's introchaic tetrameter. Um, now, you can look at this in two ways. Some people say that that rhyming couplet has a sort of swing to it, a sort of upbeat, childlike, innocent rhythm, in which case it would be quite ironic. So deliberately using a sing-song rhythm, uh, ironically, to emphasise the potential darkness and danger of the tiger and mankind. The other thing that you could say is that the rhythm, the fact that there is a clear, distinct rhythm and metre, is about creating a steady beat and it's actually about echoing the sound of the blacksmith creating his tiger metaphorically obviously but it's like the beat of the hammer coming down you can choose you can do both you can come up with something else um but just make sure that it's you know plausible Right, that's it from me. Um, thank you so much for watching. Hope that was helpful. Give me a shout in the comments if you've got any questions. And if you did find that helpful, oh, do please subscribe to my channel. That would be super. Right, that's it from me. Happy revising.